Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that um, we get to be together again through, uh, through Zoom and to, to connect as brothers and sisters with one another and to be able to open up your word and, and really allow ourselves to, to hear and, and, and to learn from your word from Psalms tonight. God, I pray that you would use your spirit to leave Dave in, in the way that you have uh, you best want to use him tonight, but that your word most wonderfully will speak to our hearts and speak to our minds tonight. And again, I, I just pray that this is just a blessing for you that we're connecting together as a church family. Thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Josh. And uh, thank you for your hard work in setting this up. Uh, let me bring up my PowerPoint. And there we go. All right. So uh, welcome to all you hardy souls who um, are trying to fill your time with meaningful activities when you can't do a whole lot that you would like to do. And this is certainly a meaningful activity. It's been a, a joy for me. This is our fourth week, as you can see. And we've been tackling these 15 Psalms, the Psalms of Ascents, and we're on week four and going to uh, get uh, two under our belt tonight, 130 and 131, and probably a good way into 132. And next week, we'll wrap it up. And uh, for those that uh, uh, are not familiar with these, these are pilgrim psalms that are intended to uh, convey the uh, spirit and actions of pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, uh, to Mount Zion, for to come into the presence of God. They're traveling, and uh, the series of psalms helps us think through the process of being a pilgrim. It's very applicable to us. We may never go to Jerusalem, but we will find ourselves uh, on a journey. We are on a journey, uh, longing for the presence of God in our own lives. Uh, these uh, sessions go to about eight o'clock. I try to teach for an hour and I get it uh, on about five after. So it'll be about 8.05 or so when we'll quit. And then we leave a half hour or roughly at the end for those that want to stay on and ask questions or interact. So uh, with all that in mind, as we think about this metaphor of being pilgrims, we come to this uh, next section and we're going to treat Psalm 130 and 131 together. Hopefully it will make sense to you as we do that. Uh, one little note that we have come across on occasion is the uh, authorship. A few of these Psalms of Ascents actually have um, the uh, uh, ascription of, a, of an author. In this particular one, Psalm 130, it's called an ascent, Psalm of Ascent of David. And he's got uh, four or five that he has his name affixed to. <clears throat> so we always want to pay attention to that. That's part of the Hebrew text. And therefore, it may often uh, add some significance to the psalm. So for reasons that will become clear, I've lumped these two together tonight. And uh, hopefully, uh, you'll see the logic of that as we go along. Um, now, it's not as readily apparent how these two psalms fit into the Psalms of the sense of a sense. They're kind of what I call outliers in that they're unlike most of the other Psalms of a sense, there's nothing internal to the Psalm itself that might suggest that it's a uh, Psalm that's related to going up to Jerusalem. But it had, they both have the title, they're in the collection of 15 Psalms. And so we wanna take it seriously and see if we can figure out what it is that has prompted including them in this collection. And so I wanna approach them on a, from four different approaches. And this is a, a model of how you might choose to approach different Psalms as well. Uh, first of all, uh, <clears throat> I wanna see uh, if there's any clues that actually tie these two Psalms together, internal clues. Are they connected in some way from their content? Uh, the second is I want to see how they might link to the previous Psalms of Ascent, 120 to 129. A third uh, approach is to link either or both of these Psalms to what follows, the last three, 
132 to 134. And finally, uh, in what way do these two psalms fit into the total scope of the Psalms of Ascents and help us understand more about the nature of the pilgrim journey? Now, we want to do that without trying to force anything. I don't want to make up something that's not there, but I want us to be looking for these things. The element of curiosity is at the heart of studying biblical poetry, so we want to ask questions and be curious and wonder why things are the way they are. You may recall, those of you that have been a part of this up to this point, that I have uh, tried to lay out the progression of thought in the uh, Psalms of Ascents as we cover them. In this particular uh, slide, you can see that there is some pattern. And uh, so we look for that to see uh, if there is a uh, rationale for why they're organized the way they are going from stability, security to uh, escaping to back to stability, security, and so forth. And so these ideas uh, may help us to get a bigger, a better picture of the entire scope of the Psalms of Ascents. And finally, we come to Psalm uh, 130 and 131, which I'm labeling something like the pilgrim's childlike repentance and humility. <clears throat> and, and we'll wrestle with that tonight for a little bit and see how that might possibly fit in with the rest of these Psalms. So uh, this whole idea of uh, journeying to Jerusalem, being on a journey, is a little bit of a tricky theme. Uh, and, and it's tied into worship, being people of worship, wanting to come into the presence of God. And worship is always culturally a little bit of a tricky thing. And so I want to make an observation. And the observation is this. It's tempting for the pilgrim to focus on the arrival at Mount Zion where, where uh, one enters the presence of the Lord and worship can begin. All right, so that's the temptation. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a narrow slice of what I think we need to be contemplating when we think about worship on our pilgrimage. And so I would suggest that this statement is deceptive and misses the point of true worship because it's focused on the destination and obviously, we have 15 Psalms to lay out for us a rather comprehensive way of thinking about the journey, the pilgrimage from, remember Psalm 120, Meshach and Kedar, the pilgrim did not want to be there. He couldn't wait to get out. And now he's on, he or she or their families are on their way to Mount Zion. And so uh, we don't want to miss the point of true worship by just focusing on Mount Zion, because a lot of these Psalms have to do with the journey itself. So I want to suggest to us that we think about the entire pilgrim journey from confinement in Meshach and Kedar to joyful arrival in Mount Zion as an act of worship. The journey is an act of worship. And on that journey are mixtures of emotions and things that happen and things that we do. Uh, but one thing, element that's present, it seems all the time, is a longing, a yearning for the presence of God. It's not that the longing and yearning is a prequel to worship. It is worship. To long for and yearn for the presence of God is worship. And so I would say that God recognizes that the longing, yearning, and frustration that we experience on the journey are as much acts of worship as the celebration itself that we experience when we arrive in God's presence. And I want to encourage us with that. You know, if you, if you are one of those ones who's longing for the presence of God, don't diminish the value or importance of that. That is an act of worship, to desire God. David said, one thing I have uh, asked of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. And there he's He's thinking of how he longs for the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> so these two Psalms I want to approach, approach in four different ways. All right, we're looking at Psalms 130 and 131 for a few minutes. And the first is I just want to look at them individually. First of all, looking at just Psalm 130. And uh, here it is in its entirety. Psalm 130, uh, eight verses, uh, a medium-sized Psalm of Ascent. And it uh, 
has a number of interesting features that I want to highlight. And we can highlight them uh, this way by just pointing out a few key ideas that we want to see if they have any significance in this psalm. Uh, th there's a warm simplicity. You know, when I think of key words for psalms, this is just uh, warm and simple. Uh, this psalmist is really delighted that God is a forgiving God. And so you see the occurrence of words like iniquities, forgiveness, and iniquities again. And this is unique to the Psalms of Ascents. This is really the first time the sins of the people have been discussed personally in this kind of way. And then we also get the feature of waiting and hoping. And we'll come back to those because those are very important in both Psalm 130 and 131. There's the corporate element in verse seven. O Israel, hope in the Lord. And then there is the uh, rejoicing, the celebration over redemption. So clearly uh, forgiveness is one of the themes that holds this psalm together, but uh, also there's this hoping and this waiting that the psalmist talks about. And we should be asking our Columbo questions like, uh, what is the psalmist waiting for and what is the psalmist hoping for? And the answer appears to be something related to the Lord. You'll notice in verse six, my soul, in most English versions, put the word waits in, though it's left out, uh, but it's implied. My soul waits for the Lord. All right, so there's a waiting for the Lord. What is the psalmist waiting for the Lord to do? And he's waiting more than the watchmen on the city walls in Mount Zion are watching for the morning. And so he's, uh, uh, he's waiting on the Lord and we'll return to the theme of hope and wait in a second because it's very important to both of these two Psalms. Now in this Psalm also, he's very uh, cognizant of what he has derived or is what can be obtained from the Lord three times in this Psalm. He comments on God and God's actions. These are uh, things that amazes him about God. In the midst of talking about his iniquities, he marvels that there's forgiveness with God. Uh, with the Lord, there's loving kindness. That's his loyalty, his loving loyalty to his covenant people and the covenant he's made with them. And with him is abundant uh, redemption. Forgiveness, loving kindness, redemption. These are three ideas that are tagged as, as being with the Lord and the, uh, the things that we derive from our relationship with him. So, uh, you know, how does this relate to pilgrims on their journey? Well, Psalms often move on two planes. There is the individual plane and the community. That is, these Psalms are often have their private element the psalmist talking about his personal problems, talking privately to God, but quite often it morphs over into the community itself. And the idea might be that what God does for the individual is reflected in how he deals also with the community. Both individual and community are recipients of God's grace. And so the things that we celebrate about forgiveness and his loving kindness are things that we not only have individually experienced, but we celebrate them together. That's part of the gathering. That's the purpose of the gathering that we, of believers, that we celebrate uh, the goodness of God. And so forgiveness not only happens to bring about the worship of God, as we see in the end of verse four, but forgiveness is a witness to the larger community of God's people. When we talk about his favor and his deliverance. This is a key element in worship. C.S. Lewis in his little book, Reflections on the Psalms, argues that worship is incomplete until whatever we have to worship God about has been shared publicly so that God gets uh, the credit within the community of believers as well. That's really obvious in Psalm 22, which begins with David saying, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But by the end of that Psalm, he can't wait to proclaim the goodness of God amongst the believers. And the same in Psalm, <coughs> excuse me, 69. So this communal aspect of, uh, 
of uh, that we see here of worship fits well with the Psalms of Ascents. And that may be uh, one of the ideas that we take from uh, this Psalm. Uh, so this idea surfaces in Psalm 130 and verse eight, where you'll notice that uh, the Psalmist says, he will redeem all Israel from his iniquities, all Israel. Why didn't he say he redeemed me? Why didn't he say he redeems us in a general way? It's all Israel. And so this is redemption viewed corporately. And uh, for all of us, as we uh, worship together and we, if we ever return to our corporate gatherings, that we would keep in mind the idea that, uh, that this gathering is a time for all of us to celebrate uh, the goodness of God, particularly in the areas of forgiveness, his loving kindness, and his redemption. Uh, so this is a song that shows the pious pilgrim taking his place in prayer and confession within the community that surrounds him. <clears throat> Some have suggested even, and I, th I find this idea intriguing, that uh, this psalm may have been used as an adaptation of the liturgy that the pilgrims would use as they enter the city gates. Uh, so uh, just for what it's worth, I haven't found the, uh, the support uh, for that, but uh, at least one commentator uh, has made that uh, observation. I think that's a pretty uh, interesting observation. Well, there's a second approach uh, to these two Psalms, and that is looking at the other one, Psalm 131, uh, logically. And so we've looked at Psalm 130, let's look at 131. That's a real short one, as you can see. And it, uh, it's, it's, one of the most, it's one of the most comforting Psalms to read. It's only three verses. If you've never read this before, you know, this is just a, 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 a psalm that speaks of uh, humility. It's endearing. It's, it's got childlike. It's almost like a lullaby, like something you would read to your child before bedtime or a child would, would love to think about this and the word picture that's in this psalm. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, you'll notice also that there's a key idea in this, and that is at the end, O Israel, hope in the Lord, if you recognize that. Uh, it's because we just saw that in the previous psalm, and that's one of the links between the two psalms. The only times that the psalm in the psalms of ascents that this phrase occurs is here in Psalm 130 and 131, and that's a little clue that I think helps to tie these two psalms together. And so here we're seeing a picture of Israel uh, in relationship with their Lord, but it's a different picture, isn't it? You know, the picture of the child and the child leaning upon his mother, the comfort. Uh, when danger is around, the child is going to hurry to the mother and if anxious or upset or whatever. And so this whole idea then is, uh, is, is very endearing. And um, so in th that phrase links Psalm 130 and 131. A third way is to look at Psalm 130 and uh, compare it with Psalm 131. You know, what do the, how do the two match up one with the other? And so we could look at the two side by side. Here they are, you know, one's eight verses, one's three verses, uh, seemingly different ideas in the two, uh, but we're looking uh, to see if there's any commonality. At first, it looks like maybe there's nothing in common uh, between these two, but they do have some intriguing comparisons. First of all, in Psalm 130, we've noted this idea of hope and Israel hoping in the Lord. Uh, that word hope only occurs in the Psalms of Ascents in Psalm 130 and 131. As the phrase, O Israel, hope in the Lord, only occurs in Psalm 130 and 131. And so you see that there's a uniqueness to these two psalms and that they share this vocabulary, but that's found nowhere else in the 15 psalms just here. And that kind of encourages us to think of how are these two related? Uh, they've been put back to back next to each other. They both have the title Psalms of Ascents. They're coming near the end of the journey. Only three more psalms left after Psalm 131. Uh, so what, what, what was going on in the thinking of those who compiled uh, these texts. Now, hope obviously is an element here. 
uh, as I said, this word hope only occurs three times in the Psalms of, the, of Ascents right here. And uh, so it's a connector. And we can see that in putting these two uh, verses side by side, uh, Psalm 130 and verse five, uh, in his word, I hope, O Israel, hope in the Lord, in verse seven. And so the emphasis on hoping in the word becomes apparent. Uh, and we can see that in Psalm 119, um, about six times, hoping in the word. And the psalmist uses that idea here. You know, he could have just said, O, o Israel, hope in the Lord, but he said, in his word, I hope. And that, that anchors the hoping to something substantial. Uh, if we think of, of God's word in terms of perhaps the promises he's made, the assurances that have been given, the relationships that he has laid out that he desires, if those are things that are in his word, we hope in those things. We want those things. We long for those things. We're anxious, we're eager, we're expectant that God will do those things, but we get them from his word. Our hope must be re rooted somehow in his word. And so there's this eager anticipation here that uh, somehow God is going to fulfill his promises and I can't wait to see how he's gonna do that. Which of course means you have to go through a season of unmet promises. Yeah. And so that's kind of the, the, uh, the hidden uh, little dirty secret here is that yes, we want these things, but we have to wait uh, and go through the time where we uh, wait for God to do those things. So the terms hope and wait uh, have some semantic overlap. Uh, you can see in 135, uh, we have wait twice and hope twice. And hope once in 131. And waiting is a little bit different. There's a little bit of overlap between hoping and waiting. You can see it in the English words that they are you know, kind of tied together, but even in English, they have a little bit different emphasis. And uh, in the scripture, often, not always, waiting involves tension uh, because there's been a delay. David said in Psalm 40, verse 1, most English versions say, I waited patiently for the Lord. Well, if you want to be very accurate, take your Bible and scratch out that word patiently because it's not there. Nobody waits patiently. The kind of situation David was in was where he was waiting with tension. How long will this go on? How long, O oh Lord, says the psalmist. That's the, a lot of the idea often in waiting. Not always, but often. On the other hand, we have hope, which is a little bit more uplifting, uh, expectant, awaiting something to happen. Uh, even uh, Jeremiah looking at the destruction of Jerusalem in Lamentations chapter three says, therefore I have hope in him, even in the midst of the mess. And for those of us tonight who are going through these Psalms together, I hope that that's an encouragement to you as well and that you'll explore this idea and make sure that whatever you're hoping for, that God will do, that it's rooted in his word, hoping in his word. Uh, and uh, so finally, one last uh, approach would be to look at Psalms 130 and 131 in the context of all of the Psalms of Ascent, 120 to 134. Are there any other connections? And really, this is an interesting uh, study to undertake, to just go through them and try to figure it out. And let me make a comment here. There's really no simple explanation that's really clear cut in your face, hits you right between the eyes that says, here's how Psalms 130 and 131 fit in with the other 13 Psalms. But these two Psalms raise a key question that has not been raised elsewhere in the Psalms of Ascent. And it's this question, what heart attitude should characterize the pilgrim who journeys into the presence of the Lord? What attitude does he go with? And we see hints of that in the previous Psalms of Ascent. Uh, but this is kind of an introspective question. What's going on inside in the interior of the pilgrim as he journeys or she journeys towards the presence of the Lord? Well, one of the things we noted already is that this is a repentant person, Psalm 130, and 
that the pilgrim is like a weaned child, Psalm 131. And they both, based on those two Psalms, have one thing in common. They hope in the Lord. So the repentant person hopes in the Lord for what? We need to ask that question. And the weaned child, like a weaned child, would hope on his mother or her mother, so we hope in the Lord. Now, maybe it's something like this, that getting near Jerusalem, the weary pilgrim spirits are buoyed, buoyed. They're lifted up. They're saying, oh, we see the, the, the mountains of Zion off in the distance. It's getting closer and closer. And uh, the, as the journey ends, maybe the pilgrim has been prepared by this exercise in repentance and receiving of forgiveness and, and is uh, learning to trust and depend upon the Lord. And so it's all building for entry into the Lord's presence. As I said uh, earlier, the Psalm 130 is sometimes considered a liturgical psalm that would be sung as you're entering the city gates. So you're right there. So maybe that's a possibility as well. So as we think about how 130 and 131 fit into the 15 uh, Psalms of Ascent, let me give you five quick uh, suggestions of possibilities. These are possibilities. And so I would encourage you to think of them as well. Uh, the first of which is, uh, you may remember that we started out with the psalmist in distress, Psalm 120, verse 1. That's the very first statement in the Psalms of Ascent. Now, nearing Jerusalem, he calls out again, out of the depths. This may be past tense. You may be thinking back to Psalm 130, 120 and saying, I'm near Jerusalem, and I remember back when I called out of the depths. But in both cases, there's a connection here. This idea of calling out, again, only occurs these two times in the Psalms of Ascents. And uh, you may remember when we looked at Psalm 120, the idea of distress, it means to be confined, to be in a narrow space. And, and so the, the experience is one of being restricted. So he was restricted and confined. And we could say then of Psalm 120, the frustrated alien longs to escape the confining restrictions of Meshach and Kedar and head for Zion. So that's the way the Psalms of Ascent began. Then we come to 130. Out of the depths, I called out to you, O Lord. Well, what is this idea of depths? Typically in the Psalms, it means that you're underwater. You know, we see it in some other places as well, this idea that really it's like you're drowning. So he was in a constricted, restricted, narrow, confined place in Psalm 120. Now he refers to drowning, and the, and the Psalms have such a rich list of metaphors that describe the struggles of the pilgrim in this life. And being in distress and being and drowning are just two of many that the Psalms give to us. And so when we think of drowning, then we may be thinking that in Psalm 130, perhaps nearing the end of this long journey to Zion, the pilgrim might be thinking back to when he left um, Meshach and Kedar, and he's preparing his heart to enter into the presence of the Lord, but he remembers the restriction and the drowning. And so I would take Psalm 130 verse one as a reflection back on a previous experience, perhaps in Meshach and Kedar, or somewhere along the way where he found himself uh, in a situation that could be compared to being underwater. There's a second idea here as well, and that is, uh, as we just saw, this idea of water uh, can also be linked to Psalm 124 and verse 4. And so there we see that, uh, that word picture very graphically laid out for us. And uh, again, in 124 verse 4, we look at the context to see what it is that uh, might have been this metaphorical stream that was raging and engulfing and flooding the people of God. Maybe in 130 verse 1, he's thinking back to that same kind of situation because he repeats the metaphor in Psalm 130. Uh, then there's a third possible element. And this is the idea of grace or favor. You notice that in verse two, he cries out, 
let your ears be attentive to the voice of my plea for favor. Some versions say my supplications, but this uh, word for prayer here is based on the Hebrew word for favor or grace. And so it's a cry for grace. And let your ears be attentive to that. I'm pleading to you for mercy. And we saw this idea back in 123, uh, whereas his journey was just being launched, he said, our eyes are on the Lord our God until he shows favor to us. And that favor may very well be to bring them safely to Zion. Show favor to us, O Lord, show favor to us. And, uh, and so this idea of favor in, often involves in scripture, the idea of God shining his face upon his people to show favor to them. The journey's hard. Pilgrim life is not uh, portrayed in scripture in any way as an easy journey. Uh, and so it's in the context of difficult travels that these kinds of requests are made to the Lord. A fourth idea is seen in 131 verse one where the psalmist uh, says that basically he's guarding his heart against being presumptuous or too ambitious. He's setting his sights very low. I don't think that means he wants to be an underachiever necessarily as much as that he's saying, I don't want to be grandiose and assume that I can do things that I really can't do. And this is kind of a reflection perhaps of what was said back in 127 uh, verses one and two, when the psalmist says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Lest the Lord guard, guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain, vain for you to get up early, retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. And so here, these two ideas may somehow complement each other as well. And finally, as we finish these two psalms, the fifth element that connects these two uh, would be seen in this idea of from this time forth and forever. It only occurs three times in the Psalms of Ascents. The first time is in Psalm 121, verse 8. The Lord will protect your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. And then again in 125 and verse 2, uh, the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. And then Psalm 131, verse 2, like a winged child. And you see three different kind of word pictures here. One is the one of God as protector in 121. And how long will he be the protector? Forever. From now to however long forever lasts. The second is the surrounding mountains around Jerusalem, which are like the Lord surrounding his people. How long will the mountains surround Jerusalem? We don't know. But how long will the Lord uh, surround his people, and we know the answer to that is from this time forth and forever. And finally, a weaned child hoping as he leans up against his mother, and that weaned child can count on God and hope in God uh, permanently. So uh, those three ideas are only occur, well, occur these three times in the Psalms of Ascents. And let me conclude, just kind of given a, a little bit of a summary statement of Psalm 130, 131. You can see how this matches up with your thinking. Perhaps you want to consider, come up with your own summary statement. I would say with a repentant heart, the humble pilgrim's anxious spirit is calmed as he puts his hope in the Lord. Just as we children are quieted by their mother's nearness, the reassured traveler eagerly anticipates entry into the presence of the Lord. All right, so two short little Psalms, hopefully given some food for thought as to how they might uh, fit into the Psalms of Ascent and, uh, and the application that might be there for any one of us on our pilgrim journey. Well, that brings us to the longest of the three uh, of, the, of all the Psalms of Ascents, which is Psalm 132. So you see, I got part one there. I'll, I'll do some of it tonight, finish it next week. I will give you a little teaser. Psalm 133 is coming up next week. It's my favorite one of the Psalms of Ascents. The, the psalmist in many ways outdid himself in uh, the structure of that Psalm. And I just love to sit, to read that Psalm. And I love to bring out some of the stuff that's there. So 
we'll get that next week, Psalm 133. But uh, let's at least begin Psalm 132 in the time that we have, the longest of the Psalms of Ascents. And so I've been suggesting this idea, you've already seen this as we started tonight, of how these Psalms of Ascents might be organized. And uh, Psalm 132 is a little bit of an anomaly also. I'm not sure uh, exactly how it fits, although I think uh, uh, it's possible to, to plug it in. But anyway, let me just put it in there that Psalm 132 is David and God exchanging vows over God's residence. Sounds like a marriage ceremony, doesn't it? Uh, but that's not the idea. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, that's what this psalm is all about. But the whole Psalms of Ascents are about the travel to God's residence in Mount Zion. And in this psalm, we have a lengthy, uh, it's 18 verses in length. We have a lengthy discussion of David and God negotiating about where God is going to live and who gets to build it and all that kind of thing. So here you can see the entirety of the Psalm uh, 132 and one screen, hopefully the font's not too small. And, uh, and there are a number of wonderful elements in there. And it's also a very creative Psalm as well. Uh, it easily and naturally divides into two sections though. Uh, and it's around the idea of two oaths that are being made. Uh, the first oath is David's oath to God. And that's or about God's house in verses one to 10, he swore to the Lord. And then the second is the Lord swore to David, verses 11 to 18. So that's kind of a nice, tidy kind of a way of putting the psalm together. You can see that it has those two separate sections. And uh, the psalm then will be about what David swore, what kind of oath, what kind of vow did he make to God? And what did God swear to David? Do the two match up? Is, and uh, is one more important than the other. Now in this Psalm, the opening line mentions David's affliction. That's the starting point. Uh, in the Psalms of Ascents, other than Psalm 132, David's only mentioned one other time and that's in 122 verse five. So it's not like he's a frequent uh, uh, character showing up in the Psalms of Ascents just in Psalm 132 and then in 122.5. Remember David's afflictions. Well, we would want to know what kind of afflictions. David had all kinds of afflictions. Some of them were self-inflicted by his own mistakes and others were he was innocent. One of his afflictions was he wanted to build the temple, but he was denied. And uh, then uh, he was afflicted when he brought the tabernacle to Jerusalem. Remember, Oza touched the ark and he died. He was struck dead. That was an affliction. And then when he realized he couldn't build the temple, uh, he labored hard to uh, uh, acquire the materials that Solomon and his son would need. And we see that in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 14, where David says, look, with affliction, I have made preparations for the house of the Lord. So that's the same Hebrew word there. And we get a connection then between Psalm 132 and 1 Chronicles 22. There it's David's attempts to acquire the materials necessary uh, so that Solomon could build the temple. And of course, we have a little later in 1 Chronicles, uh, the statement that reminds David of God's judgment upon him. That is, you shall not build a house for me. So all this is tied into David's afflictions. His afflictions are very much focused on the building of the house. That is his passion, as we'll see. Now, for us, uh, this can only correspond, as far as I can see in my own practical life, to my desire to see the church of Christ built as well, and to see it prosper, and to be successful, and to honor him. And so we, we take this idea of David being afflicted because he was so passionate for God's dwelling place and ask ourselves, is that my passion? Uh, do I find myself consumed with the desire to see the church of Jesus Christ being all that it can be? But we can look more closely at what the affliction is in this Psalm. Uh, he goes on to say in verse two uh, through five that he made a vow to the Lord. 
So his affliction is related somehow to this vow. I'm not gonna go into my house. I'm not gonna go to bed. I won't sleep. I won't slumber until I have found a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. And uh, so uh, we see this same passion in Psalm 69 verse nine where David writes, zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. There that in Psalm 69, the word reproach shows up a number of times. David is being reproached. In verse nine, it seems as if he is being reproached because he is passionate about building the house of the Lord. And why people would reproach him for that, you know, we would have to uh, try to figure out. But his affliction then was linked to his desire to build a temple, to build the house of the Lord. What a great thing to be afflicted about, to be afflicted uh, uh, over where God is going to dwell. So David's passion for his house drove him to extreme measures. Notice what he says. I'm not going to go to sleep. I won't uh, give sleep to my eyes or slumber uh, until I'm able to complete this project. That's how serious I am about it. And uh, it appears as if he may have actually chosen that idea of sleep because of the significance of the dwelling place of God. After all, uh, just uh, a couple verses later, uh, the psalmist is going to say, Arise, O Lord, to your resting place. And again, in 132, 14, this is my resting place. And so the, the dwelling of God was viewed as his resting place. Is it possible that David's saying, why should I have a rest when God doesn't have rest? It's not just that, why should I have a house when God doesn't have a house, but God doesn't have his resting place. I got a resting place. Well, I'm not going to go rest in my resting place until God can rest in his resting place. Now, what we see there in verses uh, three, four, and five uh, is nowhere else in scripture. You know, so it looks as if maybe the psalmist has taken a little bit of poetic license to summarize a number of ideas that express David's passions more than quoting him. He didn't really say these exact words, but certainly he had this passion or this idea. Uh, so these expressions in Psalm 132 of uh, God's resting place, you can see are in the context of his dwelling. And, and this, is a, um, this is a common expression in the ancient Near East that the tabernacle, other kings and other religions had tabernacles also, and they were treated as resting places, even carried to the battlefield so that the king could rest in his tabernacle while the battle is being engaged. And you also see this word footstool that we'll come back to in just a moment. So this is a common idea. Uh, we have evidence of the pharaohs when they went to battle from Egypt, they had their tabernacles taken out near the battle scene. And that would be their resting place and their staging uh, position uh, to plan the battle. So in addition to resting places, I've already noted, uh, this also has reference to a footstool. So we got the, the picture of a resting place and the picture of a footstool, both found here in uh, Psalm 132, but also frequently elsewhere. I didn't have time to list all the occurrences, but there are an abundance of them. And so this idea of the footstool is really interesting as well. You know, you, picture, you might picture the king sitting in his den with his ottoman in front of him saying, man, my feet are tired. I'm going to prop my feet up. But that's not the idea at all. This is a, uh, a uh, metaphor for what would happen on the battlefield or in conquering other, um, other nations. Here you can see there is a, uh, an, uh, an etching here. And if you look carefully down at the bottom, you'll see on the right, the monarch has his foot on the head of a conquered foe. That's his footstool there. And so uh, I believe this is an Assyrian relief, but it's, uh, it's a good illustration of the idea. And even from the Roman period, we can see this Roman soldier with his foot on someone that he has conquered. 
And uh, so it's obviously uh, an indication that you have won the battle because when you can put your feet on someone else without them resisting, you know it's pretty much over, which is a wonderful picture also of the grand theme of the Bible, which is the conquering hero, uh, Jesus, uh, crushing the head of his enemy, that is Satan, is found in Genesis 3.15, the crushing of the head of the serpent. And so uh, he is the one who will do that crushing, but he will engage his church in doing that. Romans 16, 20, Paul writes to the church at Rome and says, now shortly, this is first century AD, keep in mind. Now shortly, uh, Satan's head will be crushed under your feet. And so we are part of the army, that the militia that God has assembled that will bring about the crushing of the serpent's head. So all these metaphors, you know, just kind of pile on top of each other to, to express what David is thinking. And it reflects the fact that he is aware of the history behind the tabernacle and the dwelling place of God and God's desires. Now we come then to uh, this idea in verses uh, uh, six to 10 of a reenactment of worship. We call this a reenactment because the psalmist again, wants us to get the idea of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. He's going to do it in, a, in, in poetic language that, for the most part, we might just slide right over and not get if we didn't take time to explore it. So let's think about this for a moment. <coughs> he says, we heard it in Ephrathah. We found it in the field of Jar. Now, both of those uh, I'll come back to in a moment and explain what he means. Uh, but the idea is that uh, Israel is being called upon to reenact in some way, either just through song, they may even do it through drama, the bringing of the ark into the, into the confines of Jerusalem. And the first thing is to say, we heard about it. Oh, we found it. All right. So it's like this quest has been undertaken where we... We wanted to get the ark into Jerusalem, but where is it? Where was it? We heard that it might be in Ephrathah. We heard about it over there, and we found it, though, in the field of Jar. Let's go. Let's take this, uh, this ark of the covenant into his dwelling place. Let's worship at his footstool. And so then the, the psalmist will continue. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. See how it's just... Uh, get in a worshipful way, reenacting and repeating the actions that David undertook to get the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Uh, so it's a great uh, illustration of how worship might have occurred. Uh, and this is not necessarily completely historically accurate, but that's not the point. His purpose is not to recreate history, it's to reenact an event, and he's doing it with poetry. So Samuel and Chronicles both tell us about this idea of David finding the Ark of the Covenant and wanting to bring it to Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel 6, verse 2, it's said that it's found in Baal, Judah. And in uh, Chronicles, it said that they wanted to bring the Ark of God from Kiriat Irim. So they went up to Baal, that is Kiriat Irim. Now, these are places that you might not even care about, you can't pronounce them probably, but just to say, you can see the note at the bottom that uh, Baala Judah and Baala, Baala refer to the same place. And it's better known as Kiryat Irim. In our English Bibles, it's Kiryat Jerim, but properly pronounced Kiryat Irim. So it's saying that D David went to Kiryat Irim to bring up the Ark of the Covenant and to uh, get it into Jerusalem. Now we can see what that journey might have been like. I want to show you two maps as I close so you get a picture of this. All right, so you can see this is a map of, uh, of Judah and uh, you can kind of, if you look carefully, you can see where Jerusalem is. You see the Dead Sea there. Uh, off far on the left, you see the Philistine country. So, you know, you get the general feel of the layout. And so what he's saying is that we heard about it in Ephrathah. Now, Ephrathah is, uh, is uh, equated typically in the Bible with Bethlehem. Uh, there's no evidence the Ark of the Covenant was ever at Bethlehem. So again, it's, it's, it's poetic literature. It's, that's where David is from. That's David's home. 
you know, so maybe there's some poetic license here that he said, we heard it was in Bethlehem. We heard it was in Ephrathah. Eph and then, aha, we found it. It was in Baalah, Judah, Kiryat Irene, you know, which is not that far, you know, less than a day's journey, uh, north and west of Bethlehem. And so uh, it's like, that's where we found it. We heard about it and we traveled, we looked around, we found out it was in uh, Baalah, Ju Ju Judah or Kiryat Irene. So what did we do? We brought it into Jerusalem and that's where it stayed. That was its destination. So that's what this Psalm is talking about is that these three places, Ephrathah, uh, Kiryat Eurim and Jerusalem are simply the stages of this reenactment of how did the ark ever end up in Jerusalem? Here's how the ark ended up in Jerusalem. But there's an even bigger story behind this. I want to close with this uh, because the question is what was the ark doing in Kiryat Eurim? How did it end up there? And it's very easily uh, laid out for us. And again, here's a different map. Uh, obviously, but you can see, it's a little clearer perhaps, you can see uh, the key locations. And this, uh, this journey to Kiryat Irin begins in a place called Shiloh. That's where uh, Hannah was with Eli the high priest and Elkanah, her husband, Samuel was born there. Okay, and so th that's where uh, it, was, uh, it was located. And then if you recall in 1 Samuel 4, Israel was fighting a border war with the Philistines and they were doing badly. And someone said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we take the ark over to the battle scene? That'll get God right in the midst of it and maybe that will bring us some good luck. And so they take the ark uh, from Shiloh over to the battle scene at a place called Aphek. And they're fighting the Philistines there and the Philistines get aroused by this and it causes them to fight even harder. And you may remember the story in 1 Samuel 4, uh, 5, and 6, that the ark gets stolen and it's taken down into Philistine territory. And it's going to be there for some time. Uh, it's not going to be a pleasant experience for the Philistines because wherever it goes, it goes to three different cities. They keep passing it around because wherever it goes, it brings bad luck. People are getting sick. The gods and their temples are, are falling over and breaking their arms. And so uh it's it doesn't uh it's not working out so they said what can we do and somebody said well let's put it on an ox cart and let the oxen take it wherever it, they want to take it so they put it on a cart led by two oxen they don't steer it or anything they just send them on their way and they go to a place called Beit Shemesh which is uh southwest of Jerusalem this is a border city between Judah and Philistia. So it's right on the border. I dug there one summer when I was on a dig in Israel and you can see uh, almost to the Mediterranean Sea from there as well as you can see much of Philistine country. And so it, uh, it shows up at Beit Shemesh. These would have been mostly Israelites in Beit Shemesh. And they get nosy and say, hmm, I wonder what's in there. I heard there's, you know, this manna. What's, I wonder what that looks like. And Maybe we can see the tablets. And so they open it up and they uh, experience bad fortune because of that. And so they said, uh, let's get rid of it. Where can we take it? And there's this nice guy that lives up in Kiryat Irim. Let's take it up there. And so it goes to Kiryat Irim and it's there for 20 years. Till David says, I want to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And somebody says, well, we heard about it in Ephrata. Oh, it's over in the field of Jar. And Jar is a word. You can see I-E-A-R-I-M in the Hebrew. That would be the word Jar also. And so the, it's in the field of Jar, Kiryat or Irim. Let's go and get it. And all of this is presupposed uh, in a couple of verses there in Psalm 132 where this, uh, the psalmist wants to reenact and recreate this whole journey of the Ark of the Covenant uh, from Kiryat Irim into Jerusalem, where David will set it up 
and uh, it will become a shrine there. And then Solomon, of course, will put it in the temple when he builds the temple. So that brings us to our cutoff point for tonight, about eight o'clock. And uh, we've gone through Psalm 130 and 131 and about halfway through our presentation on Psalm 132. We'll finish that Psalm next week. We'll get into that delightful little Psalm 133 and wrap it up with 134, which is also great. So hope everybody can come back for the finale. You've hung in there this long, just one more week and we'll put it to bed. So uh, Josh, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, I, I just simply wanna add that um, as you were going through Psalm 130 and 131, you went back and referenced some of the earlier Psalms of Ascent 120, 121. Again, for those who may have missed it, um, we do have these videos online. Uh, I mentioned that the first one, you might fear you might miss out. You did miss out, of course, in the first week, but the first video have in line actually begins with Psalm 120. So uh, if you're curious, go back and have a look and you'll see a little bit of what Dave was talking about. Uh, but Dave, you just wanna close this in prayer and then we can uh, enter into our discussion time afterwards. All right, well, let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time that we've had, the privilege of looking into your word, how rich it is, how practical. I think of all of us tonight uh, on this conference uh, class, and, and we're all journeys, uh, pilgrims on a journey, and we're traveling through life, uh, and we have here a quest that right now we could uh, enter into your presence in a deeper and more profound way, but we also look for that time when we will uh, be with you in eternity in the new heavens and new earth. So we are filled with hope and expectation. We long for that. And thank you for the reminders that are in these Psalms of Ascent as to what yet awaits us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.